Welcome, everyone, Bankless Nation. This is State of the Nation, Episode 6. David and I do these every single Tuesday. We broadcast them live on YouTube. Well, not live, actually. We're, we're getting One in. day. One day. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, the same day turnaround on YouTube, and then we post it also on Wednesdays to the podcast feed. We are here to talk about what is happening in the bankless nation. That means what's happening in crypto, what's happening in DeFi. We relate it to the big picture things. We so show you some visuals. We drop some insights and action items. Sometimes we even bring in a special guest. And today we have a special guest that we will uh, surprise you with in just a few minutes. David, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing absolutely fantastic. Got down off of a mountain uh, this weekend and came back to a totally different uh, DeFi. It moved so fast. It moved so fast. So you, you like was that like two days and you missed um, you missed like two years in DeFi? Yeah, kind of it was it was 36 hours and now uh, I'm just behind. You're gonna have to find, find a new <laughs> bankless buddy who can keep up fa faster than I can. <laughs> All right. Well, I was checking things over the weekend, so I think I've got us covered, but. Um, you know, there's a few things I don't understand as usual. It's, <laughs> it's becoming too much uh, to keep up with. Um, before we, I ask you the question, David, mm -hmm. we should talk about two things that are going on this week. So the first is we actually have Rune uh, Christensen, the founder of Maker, who's going to be in the Bankless Discord at 12 p.m. July uh, Thursday. What's July 23rd? Thursday, July 3rd, 12 p.m. Eastern time. So if you are a Bankless Nation member, Make sure you make that. We get to ask Rune anything we want. We did this with uh, Robert Leshner of Compound last week. Um, did this with Edamar from Argent. It's just a, a fantastic way to learn a bit more about these protocols. So catch that. Also, David, uh, you are releasing a new Bankless show. I hope to help you on that sometime, but you are taking the lead on that. Can you tell us about that and um, what you're going to be releasing next? Yeah, we now have the Meet the Nation series where uh, new projects, uh, kind of projects that need some more exposure, projects that people haven't heard about, um, are able to meet the nation. So we just released our first one with the Reflexor Labs project, which is producing the Rye Stable-ish coin. Uh, and so if you want to know what Reflexor Labs and Rye is all about, you can go and listen to and watch the Meet the Nation where I interviewed uh, Steven Ionescu, I believe is, is how you pronounce his last name, from the Reflexor Labs team. Uh, their project is, is very comparable to MakerDAO, and we kind of pull back the layers and get into it with, uh, with Steven on the Meet the Nation. Uh, and we're going to be rolling this out for every project that is new, every up and coming project, any project that you have questions about, you can always ping me, ping Ryan, tell us that you want to get some project on to meet the nation and we will get that done. So this is like the way to learn about the next big things that are going mm -hmm. on in DeFi. So on State of the Nation, we talk a lot about current events, current protocols, but Meet the Nation is a chance to, as, as we like to say, front run the opportunity and get a little bit ahead of what's happening next, what could happen next in DeFi. I learned a ton from your interview uh, on Rye that these things are, are almost like, um, hmm, they remove the, the volatility mm -hmm. in a way that DAI doesn't. Super interesting. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, you're doing one today, right, David? I'm doing one today with the, with the Ampleforth team because there's a lot of un, unanswered questions I have about Ampleforth, which we're, which we're going to get into. So oh, it's gonna be a good one. I have some unanswered questions too. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, should, we should talk about that later in the, in the show that, today. That's exactly what we're going to get into with Meet the Nation. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, let's definitely do that. So um, what do people need to do to catch Meet the Nation? Mm -hmm. Subscribe on YouTube pretty much, right? Yeah, subscribe on YouTube. It's not, there's not going to be one Meet the Nation day. We're going to record these as, uh, as we deem necessary. If, not, if no new projects come out in a week, which probably hopefully never happens, but seems in DeFi, they always, they all, something always happens. And so um, whenever something good comes out, whenever there's a worthy team that we want to meet the nation, we'll meet the nation. But if there's not, there's not. Um, and so the only really way to, to do that and pay attention is to A, subscribe to the YouTube and B, follow the Bankless HQ Twitter account because that's where we will be tweeting out uh, the Meet the Nation episodes. You heard it. Uh, David, I've got a feeling you might be having to do one of these like every day pretty yeah. soon because yeah. DeFi it, it, is just yeah. coming fast and furious. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so uh, the question, the question mm -hmm. of the state of the nation is always this, David, what is the state of the nation right now, sir? 
Yeah, we've already hinted at it pretty pretty strongly thus far, but the state of the bankless nation is exponential. Things are absolutely crazy right now. Uh, like, like I said, I went to the mountains this weekend and I came back and there's this brand new thing called called Yiffy, uh, this new token. Wait, what's Yiffy? Y-F-I? Uh, Y-F-I? Yeah, is that is that it? Is that it? maybe I'm yeah, the that's one it. Who pronounces it that way? Uh, <laughs> no, no. But yeah, it's it's the it's the curve. New. It's the curve token. It, apparently, it's it's DeFi liquidity mining, but like on steroids. I don't understand how it works. I I've uh, I listened to Eric and Anthony on the the um, ETH Hub weekly recap, and and I tried to understand how it works there, and I still didn't get it. Like, and I'm this I live in this stuff, and I still don't get it. And so like if if I don't get it, like so many other people don't get it. DeFi is moving so incredibly fast. Like gas prices are above a hundred gray right now. They were at seventy gray yesterday and seventy gray the day before. That's absolutely insane. Uh, I, I have friends of friends who are asking me about DeFi. I have friends. Wait, really? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, dude. Like, are, and, like you're getting texts. Oh, wait, are yeah. they saying are they saying the words DeFi? Or are they asking for like like um, Ripple tips and stuff no, like that? No, instead of Ripple, it's Link. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's DeFi okay. and Link. It's DeFi and Link. But they and, say DeFi because yeah. I got a Link text yeah, from you a got buddy a link of mine. Text. Yeah, no, I, I got, got I got text. one I got one DeFi text. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did you and say they, about Link? You're gonna make the Link Marines mad. Okay. Or maybe you're not. Maybe you're gonna be bullish. I don't know. Yeah. So like, okay, this is a little bit of a tangent, but like, I'm of, I'm ready to be convinced that like things like Link, things like Synthetics, they're all like Link is over a billion dollar market cap, but Synthetics is below a billion. But then there's like Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash and like Cardano and EOS. They're still in like the top 10, <laughs> top 15 billion dollars market cap. Like Link is totally worthy of displacing them. Like Link could go to could could go and, and take off EOS. Wait, are you saying it's a better shitcoin than the other shitcoins? <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> Sorry. perhaps, perhaps, okay. yeah. And like, so could all the other. Like Kyber deser- deserves to be up there. Synthetics deserves to be up there. At least Ooh. in comparison to Litecoin, like Litecoin doesn't deserve to be up there. And so, I while I say the state of the nation is exponential, like we could be in the very beginning of that exponential curve. All right, yeah. so open mind. You've got an open mind on that. We're going to talk about that too. I think that's mm-hmm. uh, our, our first topic mm-hmm. with our guest actually to talk about what's going on with DeFi tokens and some of the exponential growth that we've seen. But before we do, David, we've got to talk about our sponsors. The first is Ave. Oh, pardon me, that's me. Ave, <laughs> Ave is a borrowing and lending protocol on Ethereum, one of the many tokens that are absolutely mooning. And I hope to one day have it displace all the other shit coins out there like Litecoin and, and all the other ones in the top 10 that I just mentioned. Uh, the Ave is a borrowing lending protocol that is a little bit different, got a little bit of extra tools and tricks up its sleeve. The one that I really enjoy is the stable interest rates loans. That's a really important money Lego in order to bring crypto to the mainstream and replicate some of the financial services that we find in the real world, but on Ethereum. Uh, stable interest rates are, are incredibly important to be able to plan out and predict your financial future, and you can access stable interest rates via Ave. For developers and the creative types, uh, you can get real crazy with their flash loans protocol where you can borrow up a, a large and large, large amounts of, of collateral for, for no, for no uh, collateral, no deposits, so long as you pay it back in the same transaction. So you can do some pretty crazy stuff with that. Uh, check them out at Ave.com. Awesome. And also speaking of Ave, I want to tell you about Argent. So Argent is the best DeFi wallet for DeFi, hands down, especially if you're using mobile. David was talking about Ave. Um, you can access Ave. It's currently free. I think they've extended it. So if you're doing anything with Ave in Argent, there's no gas prices. And that actually means a lot these days. You can also access Compound, Pool Together, Kyber, Token Sets, this is really a, almost like a, if, if you're in the US, you know Venmo, this is like a Venmo experience for DeFi. It's super secure, easy to use. There's no seed phrases involved. You can have guardian and social recovery. So you could uh, bring in some of your friends uh, in, into uh, recovering your wallet in the event that you lose your mobile. They've got over 20 million in locked assets. I bet that's going to climb as well. It is the most bankless wallet with good UX out there. Uh, so check them out at argent.xyz. That's 
R-G-E-N-T dot X-Y-Z. We will include a link in the show notes. Okay, David, we're talking about shit coins. I don't, you know, I, I struggle with that term because I think it's a, I think it's abuse, you know, like um, yeah, particularly uh, around like among maximalists. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some coins out there that clearly, unless they are viably competing as a money, mm -hmm. they are not worth nearly the market caps that, um, that the market sees them as worth ascribes to them, yeah. to, ascribes to them today. Um, our first topic, we want to talk about this Q2 token report. So the second quarter token report that Lucas Campbell put out on Bankless. Lucas is a talented researcher. Uh, he researches, you know, all of these kind of token economics and he put out this fantastic report. We've actually, we're bringing him on the show. R Lucas, are you, uh, are you there? I am. How are oh. you guys doing? Welcome, Good, Lucas. man. How are you doing, Lucas? Just dandy on this uh, fine Tuesday morning. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, you killed it with this report, dude. It's like really good. Uh, when I read it, I was like, you know what? We're starting to get to the level where we've got like Wall Street level analysis and metrics supporting some of these token assets. So kudos to you. I think it was mm -hmm. super well received. Uh, well done on it. I'm actually going to share aspects of it, Lucas. Mm -hmm. um, on the screen so we can we can talk over a couple of the findings but maybe you could start with um like we've talked a lot on bankless about DeFi tokens being a new asset subclass in crypto mm -hmm. they are crypto capital assets can you talk a little bit about what a crypto capital asset is and how it's different from other assets in crypto yeah, so crypto capital assets are kind of this new emerging asset class within, you know, crypto assets, right? And I think the the notable difference here is that these protocols or these assets are, you know, have tangible value thrown, flowing through them. Um, so you're able to take, you know, traditional valuation methods like PE ratios and DCF models, and uh, you're able to model how these tokens stack up to their peers. Um, an attempt to find, you know, like a fair valuation. Uh, so that's probably the notable difference. Like when you're talking about like other shit coins, like Litecoin and whatnot, there's <laughs> marginal fees and what uh, <laughs> on the network. So it's really tough to value those tokens based on their cash flows. Um, so that's kind of really the key differentiation between um, a majority of crypto assets and then the crypto capital asset is that there's this tangible <clears throat> amount of cash flows uh, flowing through the uh, the protocol. And this is a, kind of what we talked about, uh, talked about with Ben Hunt, right? Where um, yes. mm -hmm. there was a, there's a very strong transition in crypto right now. While I still believe a lot of these valuations are kind of just based on traditional crypto valuations, where it's mostly just supply and demand and narrative and story. There is now ways to measure these things in very grounded and fundamental valuations. And I think that's partly why the DeFi narrative is so strong right now is because we can actually see cash flow. We can mm -hmm. actually see real value in ways that we cannot see with like Litecoin or Bitcoin Cash or Cardano or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like Ben was talking about um, basically getting back to sort of fundamentals and the tie between true fundamentals investors who still see a world, even in stocks, that is you know, based on cash flows as a fundamental. Uh, and this asset class is, is starting to become that in crypto. So it's cool that like uh, traditional investors who are used to models to value stocks can now value some of these DeFi tokens that way. That said, it's been absolutely um, explosive, like the growth. I want to maybe <laughs> f flip forward to this to talk about token performance in Q2, right? So Q2, April mm -hmm. through June, of course, um, I've got a, a chart up that was included in your report, Lucas, that shows token performance. And we've got BNT, that's Bancor, right? Um, we've got Lend, we've got Ren. These grew, like the first two, they grew by over 500%. So they did a 5X just in one quarter. Ren grew 2X, Synthetics almost 2X. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's done a lot more this quarter, but like that's some pretty explosive growth. Is this growth deserved, Lucas? What do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. 
Um, if had you asked me what the state of the nation is, I would have said mooning. Um, <laughs> these tokens just have been going off. Like most of them have increased by like triple digit uh, percentage gains. So it's just been, you know, wild. If you told me, ask me if you were deserved, that's a little bit more nuanced. Um, Cause if you look at like the fundamentals, like earnings have gone down by a substantial amount. Um, this is largely due to maker having this 0% stability fee, um, which drastically kind of uh, reduced earnings in the DeFi sector. Oh, so um, let's talk about that. So I've got the earnings chart open. So um, if you're on the podcast, I mean, ch check out the video. The, the video is where you could see this, visualize this stuff, or ch check out the report, you'll see this graph. Yeah, this but is why got, we do the video. Yeah. So go, so go, go to the video. Go to the video. Get the, so we've got Q1 here, right? Um, so look at the Q1 uh, bar chart here. These are earnings, right? So to be clear, these are all of the cash flows that these DeFi tokens have actually generated. So real cash flows. We talked about this in our Chris Brinitzi, Brinitzi podcast. This is super cool. So Q1, the, it, uh, DeFi protocols did 5.5 million in cash flows in one quarter, right? So that's annualized. It's about 20 million, right? Um, Q2, it's down. This is what you're saying, Lucas. It's down to about mm -hmm. 4 million. Um, what's interesting about this is the bars, like the tokens that make up that amount have completely changed from mm -hmm. Q1, right? So like synthetics just almost evaporated. Maker, as you were saying, almost evapor evaporated. They're tiny. Um, now, and, and other protocols, it looks like. Yeah, hmm, there's no one? significant leader. Those are all pretty equal. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we see a drop, right? As you're saying. Um, but we also see great, far greater diversity in Q2. Is that, is that kind of what you're seeing too? Yeah, so we saw like a lot of notable new entrants, a lot of protocol upgrades in Q2. Um, for one, we saw Uniswap V2 launch in May. We also saw the launch of Balancer, Ren launched on Mainnet, Genosis launched their decks, Loopring was launching uh, their Layer 2 decks. Um, so we just saw like a lot of new entrants into the DeFi space, which, you know, in turn just made it a lot more diverse. Um, but yeah, lots of new players in the space now. And you said maker is out because, because why? Because their stability fees, that's the interest they charge on their loans dropped to mm -hmm. zero. And the reason it dropped is to try to stabilize die. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Why did synthetics said, drop? Um, so synthetics was kind of disproportionately reporting their earnings due to some front running issues back in Q1 and early Q2. Um, but I believe they fixed it for the most part. So now they're kind of reporting more, accurate earnings, um, which is just a lot lower naturally. Not all of these have tokens I'm noticing here, uh, right, Lucas? So Uniswap mm -hmm. V2 does not have a token that can capture that value. DYDX right. does also does not have a token to capture that value, mm -hmm. but the rest do. That, is that another distinction you'd make? Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so very cool. So we've got real earnings. We've got massive price appreciation. Um, and you and Bankless, and I feel like Token Terminal and maybe a few others have pioneered this, um, this additional look at relative valuations of tokens. That's super important. And mm -hmm. that, that, that almost creates like a, a um, price to earnings ratio, right? So if, if you're analyzing stocks, um, maybe you could talk about what a price to earnings ratio is in the stock world and then how that relates to price to earnings in these DeFi tokens. Yeah. So a PE ratio is just like one of the, you know, basic metrics for valuing an asset. So really what it means at the core is that investors are willing to pay X dollars for every one generated by the company today. So what that means, let's say Apple has a PE ratio of 80. So investors are saying that they're willing to pay $80 for every dollar earned by Apple today. Um, and really what that measures is the future growth potential that the market believes that that asset has. Um, so we can take that same uh, framework and apply it to DeFi tokens, given that they have these cash flows. Um, so yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so generally with PEs and stocks, you might mm -hmm. see um, stocks that 
there's high expectations of, of future growth, like tech stocks, those would have a right. higher PE ratio, right? It's not necessarily that they're overvalued. It's that the market expects them to um, grow faster, grow to their grow into that, that valuation. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Versus yeah. like a, um, uh, a general elect- electric or something, right. Which is mm-hmm. like, I don't know. They're do- like, um, they're not 10 Xing anytime soon. They're not 10 Xing. <laughs> there may be right. like a, mm-hmm. an eight to a 15 PE right. ratio depending on the market. Right. Whereas like a Netflix, that's going to be like a hundred or something like that. Wait, sure. what, what's, how about a Tesla? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah that, that's the, the real one. <laughs> Tesla's valued at two hundred eighty billion or so, and they don't even make any money, right? Okay, so so that- that's just like one of the nuances. And then like Zoom, which is just video technology that we're actually on right now, has a PE ratio of like twelve hundred or something like that. Insane, okay. right? So like okay. when you're looking at these DeFi tokens, and when you're looking at you know the addressable market, these are like open financial software accessible by anyone in the world. And then when you compare that to like Zoom, who's posting higher PE ratios than most of these DeFi tokens and it's video conferencing technology that's been around for 20 years, um, you just kind of see that there's massive growth potential ahead. And like, despite the fact that we're in the hundreds for a lot of these DeFi tokens, it's actually not that bad, relatively speaking. Yeah, so like what is a Netflix, for instance? Yeah, so PE Netflix, ratio. let's look it up. I mean, I I would guess somewhere in the in the current market, like a hundred range or something. Like that. Yeah, it's about eighty four right now. Yeah. Okay, so that's eighty four PE, and we've got in this chart we've got a Bancor at uh, ninety two. That's right? the lowest right. one, right? That's the lowest mm-hmm. one. Um, the the other thing that's interesting about this, I think, Lucas, is um, pro- both protocols and companies can kind of you know dial up their earnings and dial down, right? Like so. Mm. Amazon went through a uh, large phase. They're still in it at, to some level where they, you know, Bezos was just like, I'm going to recycle all of our profit. We're going to make zero dollars because I'm going to recycle all of our profits into making our prices the most competitive. And I'm going to do that to gobble up market share and get network effect and then basically own the world. Right. So for many years, uh, Amazon had like zero profit or, ne- or negative profit. Um, but more recently, they've started to dial that up. And at any time, like they could just dial that up and right. be an insanely profitable company. Mm-hmm. So PE can mm-hmm. be a little deceiving on that level too, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's super interesting to think about that. Like that can't really happen to the same level. I mean, I guess it could happen through like governance, right? Like if you wanted to reinvest the earnings or the mm-hmm. cash flows, like governance could, I guess, elect to do that, but it's definitely a much more like nuanced situation than something like Amazon where Bezos is just like, hey, we're going to reinvest all of our money and we're going to post negative earnings. I, th- I'm, I just want to appreciate the fact that we're actually having this conversation where like, and, and so Lucas, like hats off of, of generating like a graph with PE ratios of all the DeFi protocols and now th- allowing us to make comparisons to the stock market, right? And like mm-hmm. being able to compare things to the stock market, which is like our foundation for valuating stuff is insanely just A, awesome. And, and I'm just B, I'm finally glad we're here. We're here now. Like we can do, we can have these conversations. The fact that we're, we're having this conversation, I think is just insanely bullish. Yeah, I mean, big shout out to Token Terminal. They're really the ones, you know, behind this and the ones pioneering uh, the PE ratio and aggregating all this data. So big shout out to them. I'm going to pull this up, by the way. This is Token Terminal, guys, um, if you haven't seen it. So it, um, it will show you basic, more than just DeFi protocols, but um, a lot of crypto assets and their PE ratios and their earnings over time. They even put uh, Ethereum, Ether, and Bitcoin in this list. Uh, Bitcoin I find. has a super high PE ratio, <laughs> 1100. <laughs> so this is what, dude, this is why if Ether is just stupidly undervalued. It's I, like, so undervalued. It's, insane. it's stupid. Look, it's insane. If, even if Ether is just a capital asset and you don't uh-huh. buy the ETH is money, economic bandwidth, everything we freaking talk about on Bankless, right. its PE ratio is 108. It's got a Netflix level PE ratio. Yeah. Like, and, and it's a global financial infrastructure. A global financial system. <laughs> like, whatever. The market will figure that out. I'm just, right. I'm, I'm angry at this point because <laughs> ETH is so stupidly undervalued. The Tezos is valued at 41,000 PE ratio. Jesus. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. It's, um, well, so, so back to what we were talking about in the intro, David, right? So, um, I mean, do you think like good valuation of this stuff, Lucas and David are going to like wash all of the, let's pick on Litecoin because that's been a theme today. Uh, like wash all of the, the Litecoin and XRP garbage down the toilet and some of these assets will start to shine. Are we like starting to see, are we going to see a paradigm shift now that we've incorporated these valuation mechanisms? Lucas, go for it. Um, I think I would hope so over time, right? Like we're still super early to this game. Like compound is like the only DeFi unicorn in existence today. It's valued at 1.5 billion. Um, the rest of the DeFi protocols are valued at less than half a billion. So there's, there's a long road ahead. And I would assume that over time, the market would kind of realize that a lot of these assets are relatively undervalued and compared to like the top 10 where there's billion dollar market caps and minimal earnings or revenues on the network. Yeah. So I, th I think that we are, it's, it's possible that we are in a massive repricing event where all these DeFi protocols with real cash flows are just going to come into fashion in, to investors who are looking for something real to invest in. And so like, why today in 2020 would you have a thesis on Litecoin or Cardano or XRP or, or you know, Bitcoin SV? Like, and I say oh, why. Sure. <laughs> it's be I think it's because, and this triggers me, it's because... Um, they're operating under this like backward facing narrative of there's Bitcoin and altcoins, right? right. They're not operating under a narrative where there's three types of crypto right. assets, the asset superclasses, as we mm -hmm. call them with Berninsky, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got crypto capital assets that are earnings and cash flow. You've got mm -hmm. commodities, which you know are are based on supply and demand, and then you've got store of value of coins, mm -hmm. right? They're they're acting like uh, Bitcoin SV. And Litecoin, they're priced as if they're all store value coins competing mm -hmm. for money. Right. Right. So right. I, it that, feels like that's why it's like the altcoin narrative. It's like this mm -hmm. maximalist narrative that's not staying, keeping up with what's actually happening in the space. Yeah, Sorry. I totally agree. And, and, and like, like I said, I think, and this is why I'm kind of cautiously optimistic about thing, things that are already really highly priced in the DeFi world, things like Kyber, things like Synthetics. Uh, things like Maker and Compound, Ave, these things have gone on absolute massive runs, but they're still below a billion dollars. And like Bitcoin SV is three and a half billion dollars. Cardano is three billion dollars. Litecoin is two point eight billion dollars. There's no reason why all the DeFi protocols can't be up there with them. If those are priced like that, the DeFi protocols can also be priced like that too. And I think this next cycle that we all believe that we're about to go through, we're going to see all of these you know, the theoretical store values that aren't real store values like Bitcoin, SV, Litecoin fall out of fashion because obviously they should, or maybe I'm just biased. And then the DeFi protocols can step in because of the actual PE ratios and the actual fundamentals that we get to measure. Or is that just too bullish? <laughs> I mean, I think you're right on, right on the mark there. Um, we shall see though. I think the famous saying is the market will stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So sure. um, if we can only hope that these DeFi protocols will realize the valuations that we have, you know, especially relative to some of the stuff that's in the top 10 and valued over a billion dollars. Um, we're getting there. It will probably take a while for that to happen, but we can only hope that it will. Narratives still dominate, right, David? We should talk yeah. about ample forth, by the way. Narratives still dominate. <laughs> yeah, narratives still dominate. Yeah. That, that so there's true. some there's some other stuff in this report, uh, guys. You got to check out. Um, Lucas does a breakdown by sector. So like Dexes just absolutely crushed it, um, both in Q1 but also in Q2. What whereas um, whereas lending sector was way down as far as earnings go. Compound kind of bolstered it up through yield farming, um, and then. Another sector to take a look at is derivatives, and that's basically synthetics right now. Although we've got some interesting new entrants like um, mm -hmm. MC Dex, Mick Dex, uh, <laughs> entering entering the ring, and I'm sure we'll see others. I think we'll see a lot of others. Um, Lucas, anything else that you want to highlight from this report that we should um, be thinking about? What's what's kind of the the bottom line here for us? Um, 
That's a good question. Uh, if I said anything that we're probably just getting started, this is a multi-year, multi, ideally trillion dollar bull run that we're going through or that we think that we might be going through. And there's a long road ahead here. And equally as important, there's a lot of new tokens that have yet to launch. Um, in the DEX sector, we have Curve. In the lending sector, BZRX just uh, launched. Aave has an upgrade set for the next few weeks. Um, we're seeing UMA protocol in the derivative sector. So there's a lot of assets coming, uh, you know, coming into fruition and that are going to launch in the next few months here. So just keep an eye out for them. It sounds awesome. like what you're saying is there's plenty of room for growth. <laughs> I did write an article called the trillion dollar case for ETH. So there's <laughs> oh, plenty the of growth ahead. A world famous article at this point in time. And um, we've got right now, I love this chart. This is DeFi users. Over time, Richard Chen put this together. We're at about 260,000 DeFi users. That is the population of a, a mid-sized U.S. city. So lots of growth ahead. Growing, We're growing just, way faster than a mid-sized U.S. city, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. The Bankless Nation is the size of the city of Richmond, Virginia, basically. Um, so there's, a, nice. yeah, nice. there's, a, <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of growth ahead. All right. Awesome. Lucas, thanks. It's been a pleasure, man. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me. Cheers. Appreciate it. Take care. All right. So Bankless Nation, go check out that report. It's uh, fantastic. David, we should talk about our sponsors again before we get into the next few topics. Do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. So our next sponsor, your uh, camera's off, Ryan. Uh, our next sponsor is Ampleforth. We've talked a little bit about Ampleforth uh, so far in this episode. Ampleforth is a base money experiment, and I really want to emphasize the experiment side of things. Uh, it is a very interesting token with this crazy mechanic called a rebasing uh, mechanism where it's, so it targets a dollar, but it targets a dollar slowly. And if the price is above a dollar, you'll, you will find that there will be more supply added to the total ample force supply to bring that price down and then vice versa if it's below a dollar. Uh, and so it, it's some pretty crazy stuff happens around the rebasing. Um, but the point of ample force is that it's a non-dilutive M0 money experiment. Uh, and so it's, it's like Bitcoin in the sense that it is non-dilutive. So when you purchase a share of the all outstanding Ampleforth tokens, you are guaranteed to have that same share no matter what the supply is. So it, uh, it's, a, it's a supply elastic currency while it's also a price inelastic currency. So pretty interesting experience, experiment. Check them out at ampleforth.org. Lots of cool uh, little, there's a dashboard there to, so you can check out the state of the experiment and what's going on. Also, guys, if you are exchanging crypto, I want to tell you about our other sponsor, Diversify. So gas fees are too high. <laughs> it's very expensive to use DeFi exchanges on the base layer, but not with Diversify because Diversify is built as a professional grade, non-custodial DeFi exchange that operates in a layer two. So it settles on the Ethereum chain but all of the orders and transactions occur on a layer two that they've developed some incredible tech here. It really makes you wonder why use a centralized exchange at all when you can get a better experience on Diversify without giving up custody of your assets. So we're talking 9K transactions per, se per second, instant execution and super low fees. They also have the NEC token which is used for governance, um, and it will soon provide discounts to diversify traders. So that's something to check out as well. They were doing liquidity mining before it was cool, way back in 2018, uh, and their exchanges is fantastic. So check them out. Go to diversify.com. We will include a link in the show notes. All right, David, uh, what do you want to talk about next, man? I think we're talking about the uh, morality of price go up, morality of what? hunting. What? <laughs> what? Morality of pumping. Didn't we just say like you people shouldn't pump shit coins? Like what's going on? What are you saying? Yeah, there, there's nuance here, right? Um, and so, and Bitcoiners figure this out very, very early uh, as, because the, there's an intrinsic relationship between the health and protective barrier of a blockchain crypto system and the price of its native asset, right? And I, I wrote about this in my, my, most, my most recent article, um, 
uh, the Protocol Sync and Global Public Goods, where uh, I illustrated Ethereum is this platform for offering protection to applications, right? So Uniswap, Maker, it needs to have self-sovereignty in order to be the things that they are, right? Like a Uniswap or Maker DAO that is under state purview is not a maker or uniswap at all right so ethereum offers protection to these applications right it says you are allowed to be self-sovereign you don't have to uh you know look to the nation state to to operate and have rules and regulations you can use ethereum for your rules and regulations and ethereum itself is also self-sovereign ethereum gets its self-sovereignty from the price of ether right and so ethereum protects applications but ether protects ethereum right and so when it comes to uh, pumping ETH, quote unquote, pumping ETH, there is some amount of like service that you are providing all applications on Ethereum by trying to make sure that Ethereum is as safe and strong as possible. And that, that strength, the strength of the walls that protect Ethereum is reflected in the Ether market cap. David, are you saying it's um, our patriotic duty as Ethereans to pump the price of ETH? Is that really I'm, what you're saying? I'm not not saying that. That's what you're <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> wait. So so like, um, I've I've gotten into debates on this, and, and to be clear, like, so I think what you're talking about when you use the term pump, like you're using mm-hmm. the term pump to be a little bit provocative. It's right? a little facetious, yeah. For it's sure. a little facetious. What you're actually talking about is um, valuing the the token economics and value accrual mechanisms of ether, the asset, highly. And prioritizing mm-hmm. Ether, the asset, not just Ethereum, the network, because the price of Ether, the asset, is what gives security to the entirety of the Ethereum network. So you're saying all good Ethereum patriots should want ETH price to go up, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. you're not talking about like speculative pump so you could go dump on somebody, right? Right? Like, right. like I know you, you're holding this, you're holding this shit for like, Oh, yeah. 20 years, aren't you? <laughs> until you gotta uh, until, until I die. <laughs> gray beard, right? You're gonna yeah, stake, yeah. you're gonna like that. That's your vision. So you're not short-term pumping. You're right. talking about long-term value accrual mm-hmm. mechanisms. Did I get that right? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Also, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Um yeah. uh, and so like and I, I think there's an important nuance here where like it I think there's a relationship between the centralization of an asset or of a project and like how immoral pumping is, right? And so like, and and again, Bitcoiners figured this out where if you replace like the Bitcoin army with the XRP army or insert X army here, like they're almost indistinguishable. The difference though, is that Bitcoin is fully decentralized. So there's no central orchestrator of the pump in the same way that like there definitely is for the XRP army, right? (laughs) And so like Bitcoiners, if if, Bitcoiners are quote unquote pumping Bitcoin just as hard as XRP people are pumping XRP. But the difference is it actually serves a purpose with Bitcoin, right? It serves a means to an end because Bitcoin actually needs to go up in order to survive. Whereas like if you are, if you're a centralized team and you have a large amount of the supply of a token, pumping that is nefarious pumping that is malicious because they're probably there's too many people that are just going to be enticed to dump right and the 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 part about bitcoin and like ether is also very sufficiently decentralized when these things go up in price there isn't large bag holders at least not in comparison to how there are for centralized assets like xrp there aren't uh, large centralized bag holders that are going to dump on people when it pumps when ether pumps when bitcoin pumps it pumps for all of us right? Not just for a select few. And that's, so the decentralization of a project relates to how moral it is to pump something. And I think Ether and Bitcoin are sufficiently decentralized where like, it's not just pumping, it's like protecting the network. Okay. So, but from a community perspective, the Bitcoin community right now, they are very, very comfortable with price go up. Like, in fact, that's their main thing, right? That's the whole thing. The Ether community, the Ethereum community is historically less comfortable with that right right so i think there are there are many among us who are um you know saying things like hey the entire security of this thing there's a economic report that came up last week mm-hmm. for eth2 staking which basically said this thing works if eth price is high it doesn't work if it's not right the mm-hmm. entire security of the network basically um there are some that are comfortable with that but there's also i think a hmm, taboo I want to say right. against talking about 
ETH price, price right. in the historically in the Ethereum community. We had Vitalik on mm-hmm. uh, the podcast, and he talked a little bit about potentially talking too much about price being a moral hazard mm-hmm. and it being a an impediment to the progress of Bitcoin. So um, the criticism of Bitcoin is they've become so obsessed about price go up mm-hmm. that they're willing to sell their soul to crypto banks and and not to, to not scale the network and not extend the vision because all they care about is price go up. They're not mm-hmm. building a network for the world, right? I'm not saying I share that view. I'm just saying that's that's a right. potential criticism that they've lost sight of the goal. What do you think? Do you, do you like what do you think about this dynamic? Do you, do you somewhat agree with it too, or like are you more Bitcoiner in that way? Yeah, uh, it's it's a good question, and and it is relevant to say that like Ethereum does have its centralized components, right? Like Ethereum two is a is a centrally coordinated endeavor. Like there's many different client teams, and so that kind of decentralizes decentralizes the effort. But like we can we have a list of people who are working on ETH two, right? So that itself is inherently centralizing. We also have the EF, right? Um, so I, I'm caught in between like a lot of these client teams that are building out ETH2 and a lot of the efforts for building out ETH1.x depend on ETH price because that's what's funding these things. At the same time, if Ether price goes too high too fast, there might be like, you know, there might be some jostling, there might be some like positioning, there might be, there's a lot more value to capture and any centralized uh, entity like the EF, like the people that are handing out money to client teams, there's now like a political component as to like who's going to get that money. And so like having a little bit of money is like a nice balance because there's not a lot of, there's not much at stake. But at the same time, it would be nice if the if EF had more money to pay for more salaries for more client teams. But then there's also the political risk of like who's going to, who's, how do we decide where that money goes? So it's all a balance. So I understand that like, for, for one person uh, that is trying to pump ETH, there's another person saying like, hey, maybe we're not ready for that yet. Like maybe later, um, maybe when there's no one to like stop you. But, but right now I, I think there's a delicate balance between like trying to, trying to pump ETH and trying to have like a, a smooth, equitable network. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and the, the thing about Ethereum's token economics, it's, it's scarcity economics, is that it's price appreciation, it's scarcity is is actually linked to network usage in i think what could be a very like a very nice virtuous cycle right so if your blocks are providing value to the world that means your transactions on the ethereum network people will pay more for them right and you, you're creating more blocks as well so you're gonna have shards so you're gonna have more capacity but people will pay more for them and a portion of those fees goes into burning the actual ether token itself so usage of the network feeds back to scarcity of the eth asset that seems to me and i've heard people argue uh argue this to be a very um not non-pumpy thing to do right it 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 seems like it's like wow this is an economic network that is actually increasing the utility of its blocks the value of its blocks and the real world usage of its blocks to scarcity of its asset and pumping the price that way. Um, I mean, to me, that's like a, like when you view it like that, and by the way, we're talking about EIP 1559, it's coming in two, what could be coming in ETH1. But when you view it like that, I mean, that's a very low pump thing to do. (laughs) Compare that to like XRP Army or like, you know, Link Marines. Yeah, pump like the pumpiness is, a solution for having no fundamentals, right? Like right. that's that's what that is. And so the more we bake in fundamentals, the less we have to have this conversation, right? And so we integrate EIP 1559 and now there's nothing left to like for for people like you and me to rally around to like, hey, let's pump ETH. Let's find a new way to pump ETH. Like, no, like it, it was 1559. Now that's live. And then there's also staking live. And now the only way to pump ETH more is by supporting DeFi protocols that add more economic activity to Ethereum, which the only way that that's going to happen is by providing a real world use case, a real world utility to people that want to use that DeFi protocol. So like we get to shut up and move on. Be, be like we don't have to talk about EIP 1559 anymore. We don't have to talk about ETH price. We can just talk about like how these DeFi protocols are helping change the world because in the background, Ethereum gets it the protection it needs 
because of the fundamentals of EIP-1559. And this just fits right into the conversation we were having with Lucas earlier, where like, and this is just the whole narrative of I think 2020 is like, there are now real ways to evaluate and value these things. And yeah. like, that's, and that's what pumping is for if you don't have that. And so like pumping is for trying to replace some sort of real world valuation, real world um, meaning. If we have real world metrics and, and valuations and cash flows, et cetera, which is what EIP 1559 is and staking, then we don't have to have this nebulous, let's pump ETH conversation. It, we can just talk about like, this is how much is worth. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think that what, what we're probably agreeing on and, and saying is ETH price go up is fundamentally good. Uh, we need that in order to secure the open financial network of the world. Um, low ETH price is bad net from a utility to the, to the world perspective. The world's the worst place with low ETH price. It is. Uh, so if you, if you are supporting kind of the, the entire movement of bankless and, and DeFi, this is what I can never get around. It's like, if you're supporting that movement, we need a trustless store of value. We need mm -hmm. trustless economic bandwidth. We need a non-sovereign source of money at the M0, at the base layer, or this right. whole thing doesn't work. Right. A government can just push the button and like, deactivate the entire yeah. thing. That's the same as the traditional system. That's, That's why, why everyone's getting scared about USDC and DeFi. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, there is some morality to right. price go up, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, maybe not to short-term pumping because you're going to dump on someone based right. on some knowledge you have. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly not that, but long-term value accrual, the morality of that, I, I, uh, it checks out for me, man. <laughs> so let's <laughs> keep doing it. <laughs> All right, uh, what else do you want to talk about, David? I think we should talk about the relationship between tokens and ETH, Ryan. Ooh, okay. Wow. You want to, you right, so, yeah, take us. Well, so uh, one interesting thing that happened last week, which is not surprising at all to me, is that the asset value on Ethereum, um, the asset value of tokens on Ethereum, that is. Aggregate, so yeah, the aggregate. The aggregate, your C20s, actually passed the value of ETH, right? So I've got a graph somewhere I could show but it's something like, um, something like, I don't know, tw 25, 25 billion each was, was the number at the time, something like that. And so um, what does that mean from your perspective, David? So now we have ERC-20 tokens that are worth more than the value of ETH. So Camilla put this out, this tweet out. By the way, Camilla's book back there, Infinite Machine, pick it up. Read it. Read it. It was great. I just finished it. History of Ethereum. Um, she said that the, this disproves, or it could disprove, the FAT protocol thesis. It's, it's a challenge to the, the FAT protocol mm -hmm. thesis because tokens are capturing more value than apps. Uh, what's your take on this? Yeah, and this just fits in so well to the previous conversation where like, I, I bet this wouldn't have happened if EIP-1559 and staking was a thing. Um, <laughs> however, uh, I, I will continue to be of the opinion that like the more valuations of tokens that are on Ethereum, and, and, and like I don't even think that the FAT protocol thesis means that the native asset of a chain, Ether, actually has to be greater than the aggregate of total tokens on Ethereum. It just means yeah. that like the more value of tokens on Ethereum, the more Ether price is going to be. And, um, the, the frustrating thing I think about Ether, uh, you know, people like you and me that have Ether, uh, we want the valuation of DeFi to be like one-to-one -one tracking with the valuation of Ether, but it just doesn't do that, right? I think Ether is a huge lagging indicator for DeFi, right? And so while the current volume or, or current aggregate market cap of all tokens on Ethereum is surpassing the Ether price, like that narrative just gets flipped the moment ether goes from like $230 to like $300 or more. Right. Like when's that, when's that happening, David? Uh, tomorrow. So, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it is happening. <laughs> well, okay. It, I mean, it could, right. And so it, like the, the larger uh, market cap on Ethereum, like there it, it, just ether is just proximate to it. And at the very least, like that prox proximity is going to benefit it to some degree. Right. Um, I think EIP-1559 and staking closes that loop and makes that relationship happen faster 
But I do think that relationship is present no matter what. It's just a lagging indicator right now. You know, another thing, so um, part, part of the concern, there's been a concern for a while, I think, um, that, well, if ERC-20 tokens, if they exceed the price of ETH, the aggregate price of ETH too much, that means they're no longer secure, mm. right? Like mm -hmm. the value of ETH is not enough to secure the tokens on top. But on this, I've got to disagree because I don't think that um, most people are making the differentiation that we like to make when we talk about settlement guarantees, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. And this is so crucial for people to understand. Mm -hmm. So Masari put out this. Uh, am I sharing my screen, David? Yes, you are. Okay. Masari put out this. This is um, Ethereum versus Bitcoin daily settlement value. Okay. And Ethereum is now higher because it settles more on a daily basis of both ETH and ERC-20 tokens in aggregate. So it's settling more mm -hmm. than Bitcoin. But I actually disagree with this, okay? Because what's counted in this number, in the Ethereum number, is all of the, the, the 10 billion or so ERC-20 mm -hmm. bank-issued stable coins, right. okay? It's super important to remember that uh, bank-issued stable coins are not actually settling on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're settling in the traditional financial system. These are IOUs for money in a bank account somewhere. Right. Coin. The IOUs do settle on Ethereum, but that's yes. not the final settlement. That it's is not, not the, the final, final settlement. settlement layer. Like it's still the legal system. So it doesn't. So it's using the security of the legal system. Now it's using the um, the transport layer of DeFi and crypto, which is super useful, but it's not actually being settled on. Ethereum, just the IOUs are being settled on Ethereum. This is different. Like Bitcoin is completely settled on the, the Bitcoin network when there's a transaction on Bitcoin. Ether is completely 100% settled on the Ethereum network when there's a transaction on Ethereum, right? So um, I think people don't make this distinction. What, what's really important, what's more important is that the, the trustless assets like like Ether, for instance, or but like ERC twenties that aren't um, issued by a bank somewhere and settled in in meat space and legal space. It's really important that that value, those ERC twenties, maintain some ratio with the value of ETH, or else you could get into a situation where you know you lose the secu the security of Ethereum is not enough to keep pace with all of these digital bearer assets. Does that make sense? I, I just feel like um, a lot of people maybe don't understand that subtlety. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they should. There's, there's nuances that go even further than that, right? Like I, I do agree with you. I do want this broken out into, in between like native Ethereum assets like MKR, you know, Kyber, Aave, all the things that are native to Ethereum. Yeah. And then also the non-native assets, largely USDC and Tether. However, um, there is some, uh, the, these things do settle on Ethereum to some degree, right? Like, so I think, I think if Balancer was hacked or Uniswap was hacked or somebody got hacked and some, somebody stole a bunch of USDC, I, I think it's pretty reasonable, reasonable to think that that hacker made off with that USDC. Do you think so? Yeah. So yeah. here's what I think would happen. I think um, Coinbase would just freeze the account. You think so? Oh yeah, dude. You know, you like, so? so, you know, the Twitter hacks last week? Hmm. Um, they sent out a, um, or they had a, uh, logged into Coinbase mobile and they basically said, um, the Bitcoin address that right. the Twitter hackers used mm -hmm. has been, uh, you can't send anything to it. Yeah. It's, it's going to happen too fast though. Right. So like say, say somebody drains some account. I don't want to pick on any particular DeFi protocol, but some, somebody drains some DeFi protocols account of USDC. They immediately go to Uniswap and sell for Ether. I think right? that's possible. Well, right. so, but what are they doing? That's interesting, right? Oh, that's a good they, point. Yeah, that's a good they're point. They're swapping for Ether right away because yeah, Ether right. is the, the cash you can get away with because mm -hmm. it's the base settlement layer. Right. You don't want USDC. Yeah, you I want guess Ether. So. Mm -hmm. You want DAI, something right. with stronger settlement guarantees. Yeah. Having, closing that turnaround time for hacked protocols with centralized assets. Uh, I mean, it's also at some point like the, the Circle or Tether really actually care that much. Like they don't really lose money. Like, they're, they may like and like they, they don't really have too much responsibility to it's true yeah. it's true yeah it's true that's gonna you know, like that, that's going to happen and that's going to be interesting oh i think so like let's say let's say compound was hacked right now and you knew who the hacker was right um and they made off with a whole bunch of usdc and coinbase had time what would they do bam 
blacklist account, right. assets frozen, right. refund to sender. They'd almost be, as a company, it would almost be their fiduciary responsibility to do that. If you didn't would, do that, it would you'd get sued in legal space, right? Like yeah, I, that, that would be a very interesting court case. Um, if I very, lost my money and yeah. Coinbase had the ability to give it back to me, but didn't, mm -hmm. that feels definitely like a lawsuit. Sure. Yeah. For somebody. Yeah. Then, then we get into the whole code is law debate. Like, was it a hack or was it an exploit or, you know, what, it, did it actually use the code as intended? There's, there's a lot of dirty, dirty hairiness there. Um, I agree. I just think that um, if you're not settling on Ethereum, you know, fully, for instance, right. or on Bitcoin fully, that there's, it's not, it's not truly settled, right? Sure. So there's all this room for ambiguity. Right. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, we're not, like we're not considering that as much when, right. when people look at, you know, uh, ETH security. Anyway, Absolutely. I do think that fat protocol is right personally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at least for like money protocols. Um, you know, not, not necessarily for any protocols like in, but I think directionally it was right. Yeah. And, um, I guess we'll, We'll see. I don't know what you think about that, but I think the the fat protocol thesis is here to stay until until some ERC twenty token passes the market cap of Ether. Like that's like a, a single ERC twenty token, not all of them, right? Like I think the the fat protocol thesis is pretty flexible. Is that going to be ample for it, David? <laughs> no, it's not going to be ample for it. <laughs> Although that would make me happy. <laughs> well, Actually, no okay. one, no one, no one. <laughs> All right. So um, maybe, maybe lastly, just cause just to tease kind of meet the nation. Right. So um, I have some questions about ample forth um, and full disclosure, they're a sponsor of the show. The You're reason we took, screen, by the way, the reason, Oh shoot. Okay. The reason we took them on as a sponsor is mm -hmm. because um, is because essentially we could talk about we could talk about them the way we wanted to talk about them, right. which is as a monetary experiment. And mm -hmm. I do think it's a fascinating monetary experiment. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't have like the whole rebasing idea kind of um, throw, throws me for a loop because the supply can change on a daily basis. Right. Yeah. But this so is the just, su supply is volatile. Yeah. But, Pri price is less volatile. But if you buy, like whatever units, X units of Ampleforth, right? Let's say you bought your whale, you bought 1% of all Ampleforth in existence. You always own 1%, even though the units will actually change on you. Is that, is that right? Yeah, the, the units will go up and down, but you will always have the same percentage of the market cap that you bought at the time you bought it. Okay, so it's similar almost to like Bitcoin's 21 million, right? So Bitcoin has exactly. 20, like exactly. 21 right. million when it's fully um, diluted. And then, you know, so does Ampleforth. But I don't know that everyone understands that because people are hitting my Twitter, uh, you know, DMs and such and saying things like, um, yeah, the, like, this is a coin that just expands. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's completely different than Bitcoin or Ether. It's a coin that just sort of expands based on demand of the coin and sort of, you know, tethers itself to a dollar. I don't, I don't know that they fully understand the supply dynamics going on. I'm also skeptical of, of how much people actually understand, uh, understand it. And like, it's one of the things like, maybe, maybe I'm missing something, but I don't think I'm missing anything. Uh, okay. I, I think it's a psych I think what's happening is a very interesting psychological trick based off of how we're not used to having stable price and volatile supply. Everybody in crypto is used to stable supply and volatile price. This is the inverse. But the th fact that those things are inverse doesn't actually change much. Like it's still pretty, if it still follows the same laws of, of supply and demand. And like, and you know, there's, there's, there's a case to be made where you can just mint a, a normal ERC20 token, have fixed supply, and it kind of fulfills the same M0 experiment as Ampleforth, except it just doesn't have this rebasing mechanism to keep the supply uh, volatile and the price relatively stable. And so it's, it's really up to the Ampleforth team to like figure out how to extract utility and value out of the rebasing mechanism because you don't get stability and your value from Ampleforth because the market cap is just as volatile as any other cryptocurrency. It's just that 
it's it's taken the volatility from the price and put it into the supply, but there's still volatility. It's still present, right? Yeah. So if I own one percent of Ampleforth, going back to my whale example, that could be worth a thousand dollars today and twenty thousand dollars tomorrow and ten dollars the next day. Yes, and the Ampleforth token will still roughly be around a dollar. Right, because it adjusts daily. Yeah. So I think the way I understand it is the way you understand it. So I would be super interested to hear in your Meet the Nation, like more about that and you guys to dive into that, like, because maybe that's what it is. And if that's what it is, it's, um, it's still an interesting money experiment because no one's doing that as an ERC-20 today. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's all about like, how, how does the rebasing mechanism actually like, how can we leverage that in ways that are useful that you couldn't just leverage with a minted ERC-20 token? Like what are the ways that uh, users can actually use the rebasing mechanism to their advantage? And like, I I think we, I think it's pretty fair to claim that like we know that the market doesn't understand this because I've been watching the rebasing mechanism on Uniswap and people, when the price rebases and what, what this means is that new supply is added to everyone's wallets equally, right? So you can watch the supply in your wallet change right after the rebase every 24 hours and when this happens people rush to uniswap to buy the cheap coins but that's a total psychological fallacy because they're still buying the same percentage of the market as they were right before the rebase and so like we know the market doesn't understand this because they're falling falling to the to the psychological trick right and so like i don't think ampleforth is really going to stabilize in its market cap until the market understands this and stops stops succumbing to the psychological trick and and you use the term psychological you know trick right um but it's at some level it, it goes back to like isn't 21 million and the scarcity meme a psychological trick totally too? totally right. that's why that's, this is such a fun experiment a psychological trip to boots a trick to mm-hmm. bootstrap money basically right, right? so mm-hmm. um because money is inherently social, mm-hmm. right? In order to create it, money, you have to have a good meme, do you right. not? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And th- this is why I'm I'm happy with Ampleforth uh, being a sponsor of Bankless because the difference between a monetary experiment like Ampleforth working and not working is how how well can they distribute their token? How well can they get awareness? Because money, if if money is a meme, awareness is everything, right? Under, understanding it is is everything, right? And so, you know, w- well, like I've personally gotten some flack about like saying that Ampleforth is legitimate from some people who are hyper skeptical. I'm happy to do what I can to help them do what they need to do to spin out what could be more than experiment an experiment one day. Well, I think um, a lot of Ethereans are uncomfortable with the idea of money as a meme, to be honest, and they want even the value of Ether to be bootstrapped, not just because of a meme, but because of its raw utility. Back to right. our conversation about Which 15, is, yeah, five, nine. We've been talking about this all episode, right? Like yeah. it's great because we're getting the fundamentals. <laughs> However, there's always going to be the meme layer. There's always going to be the meme layer. It, there, it can't not be. And I, I've always thought that the meme layer is where you derive the highest level of security, right? So. If, if you are a meme coin, mm-hmm. um, like I, you have to compete as a meme coin in order to be one of the highest value mm-hmm. crypto assets in the world. To, to, to me, the meme coin or the meme side of things is just another word for monetary premium, right? Exactly. And so Bitcoin is like almost completely 100% monetary premium because there's not much utility there except for like, you know, the, the proof of work is its utility. The uh, seizure resistance is the utility. But memes are based on fundamentals, right? So there's a relationship between the fundamentals and the meme. Well, right? so the meme, the meme creates the fundamentals, right? Because I would argue No, also, I would say it's the other way around. Okay, well, so maybe they're both related, right? So because mm-hmm. uh, so I would argue right now anyway, um, Bitcoin is also useful because it's so liquid. Mm, right? right. So yes, it means itself. Utility. It means itself into liquidity into reality. Right. Totally. Right. And because of that liquidity, it's now actually useful because mm-hmm. I can use it as a trading pair almost anywhere because right. I can, you know, hold it and a reasonable amount of crypto banks or individuals mm-hmm. will accept it as real value. Mm-hmm. So like it, it, it's like a cycle where it creates right. its own value. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You can't have one without the other. So may, maybe it's a chicken and egg thing where the order doesn't really matter, but you do need both. 
right? You, you do, do need both. both. Right. Absolutely. And so like the utility of Ampleforth is this rebasing stable-ish mechanism. Uh, and it's really up to the Ampleforth team to find ways to leverage that because like, that's great that that's that utility, but they have to derive value from that. And that's okay. really the innovation behind Ampleforth that needs to happen. All right. So I create an ERC-20, David, it's got fixed supply and it's money, damn it. It's, it's, base, it's base money. It's M0, mm -hmm. right? The bankless dollar. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you in? Can we meme this thing to money? Like, sure is, that, is that how it works? I guess the question kind is of, like, yeah. if, if Ampleforth is doing this, mm -hmm. right? What's to prevent? This is the old question with, uh, in the Bitcoin community with people who are um, you questioning the value of Bitcoin. What's to prevent everyone to do it? Everyone to create their own money and kind of outcompete it or dilute mm -hmm. its, its meme because I'm just mm -hmm. competing with uh, you know, the bankless dollar or whatever. Yeah. Um, I mean, we saw that happen. That was what 2017 was. 2017 was like, make your own money. And that's why Ethereum blew up in 2017 because it was a platform for making your own money, right? Um, obviously, it didn't work out too much, but many things did survive. Uh, I wouldn't say that very many monies survived, but I, I guess Litecoin counts, I guess. It's like two and a half billion dollars. So I, I guess that kind of counted, but that, I, I guess also didn't come from 2017. Um, I mean, it's, it's partly one of the reasons why we are so optimistic about the future of, of DeFi is because anyone can spin up their own token and ascribe some amount of value to it. Whether that token turns into global money is a different conversation. But like, I'm sure if we spun up bankless coin, bankless token, there's some ways that we could ascribe value to that that would generate a market cap and then generate some meme layer on top of that as well. Like there are, there are things that we would, there's tools at our disposal that we could use. One question, um, as you as you do the Meet the Nation, is um, regulatory. Mm, yeah, um, so, big one. so Ben Hunt says, don't come at the state with you're saying your thing is money because the right. state will dominate you. That's be an interesting big, question big to threat. ask the team. Big threat. That's, that's why Satoshi was anonymous, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, super interesting discussion, David. Yeah, um, mm. I think we should wrap it up here. Um, Absolutely. If there's one thing I hope the bankless nation got out of the state of the nation, it is this. Do not buy Litecoin. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, Jordan, maybe that's it's, why. Going, it's going to zero. <laughs> no, I mean, don't bet against narratives, I guess. I mm -hmm. mean, I, we have no comment about Litecoin. Um, but what you should do as far as actions is check out the report by Lucas. It's absolutely fantastic. Take a look at Token Terminal. We will include those things in the action list. And then also check out State of the Nation. New episode releases today. So it should be available by the time or close to the time that, that you watch this. Um, David, anything else I'm missing on the action items? Uh, nothing from me, uh, but except for stay tuned for the future Meet the Nations that are coming. One will be coming this week. Awesome. All right. State of the Nation, episode six, the State of the Nation is exponential. Thanks a lot for joining us.